Oh, there we go. So there you have it, blackened white perch sliders, little fish, little sandwiches, time to pig out. That's good. So for many years, I just assumed this was a freshwater pond. You look at it, there's oak trees right up to the bank. Um, Vineyard Sound is a good three to 400 yards behind us. What I didn't realize is there's a culvert leading into this pond directly from the ocean. And as you can see behind me here, that is salt water flowing in. But this event only occurs when we get an astronomically high tide. Right now we have a full moon, it's high tide. Um, if we get a big storm surge, this can happen. But Generally, it's only three or four times a month you get this big influx of salt water coming into this pond. So the salinity is relatively low, but it is truly a brackish pond. And because of that fish like pickerel, largemouth bass, yellow perch, it's too salty for them to live in here. But it's perfect for white perch. They're thriving in here. So if you look closely, this rock right in front of the, the culvert actually has barnacles growing on it, which can tolerate very low salinity, but it's another indicator that this is indeed brackish water. As far as lure selection goes, basically anything you would use for trout would work. Little swimmers, little jig shad darts, little rubbers. I'm gonna mix it up and go with a little curly tail grub. It's always a good choice. Another good tip is I put these little desiccant silicone packs that you get inside of pill bottles and whatnot. Put these in your tackle box and they keep your hooks from rusting. Just using five pound test for my leader, fluorocarbon. They can be a little bit leader shy. And, you know, a big fish is two pounds, so a five pound test is really all you need. The old faithful improved clinch knot. Let's see if I can tie it without putting my reading glasses on. I'll give that a try. Oh, right where I stand it. <laughs> Just had one come on, blow up right where I was standing. Is one. We got our first customer of the day here. I don't think it's a big one, but at least we know they're chewing. There you have it, nice little white perch pulled out of a brackish pond here. Went for the curly tail grub. Definitely not big enough to keep. I'm gonna let this guy go, but you can see these fish are really well fed in here, real thick. Get bigger. And it seems like a lot of times they really school up tight. So if you pull one fish out of a certain spot, it's worth going right back in there. Here's one. Getting a little action here. I don't think this is a big one, but about the same size as the last.
Legal size in Massachusetts here is eight inches for white perch. And that guy I would say is about an inch short. Nice healthy fish. That one is probably worth measuring. Got to be eight inches to keep. Definitely not a big one by any stretch of the imagination, but let's put it to the test. So my knife is eight and a half inches long. Legal size limit is eight inches. So we got a keeper. And I always like to bleed my fish out. Doesn't matter what it is, whether it's a tuna, a bluefish. Just do a little cut into the gills. And that does several things. Um, gets the blood out of the fillets. Nobody likes eating a big old pile of bloody fish fillets. Also gives the fish a quicker death, which is the ethical thing to do. And the quicker they die, the better, I think, the, the meat tastes. All right, we're halfway to lunch. So right now it is early March. Um, I haven't had a fresh piece of fish since the tog season in November. Uh, and these are really the only viable option right now for you want to go out, catch something that you can bring home, cook up. And they taste really good. It's, um, this is brackish water. There's definitely some salinity to it. And I think that really enhances the flavor of the fish. I've eaten white perch that have come directly out of freshwater ponds. And I don't think they're nearly as good as the ones that come out of the brackish water. There's a whitey. This guy's charging right at me. He wants to get eaten. So far these have all, all been kind of cookie cutter size wise. Around eight and a half, nine inches. I think that one's probably gonna keep. I'm bring them over, put them on the varsity squad on the stringer. Once again, we'll use my trusty measuring device. We got an eight and a half inch knife. That's probably a nine and a half inch fish. As far as tackle goes for these things, you know, a really big white perch is going to probably be under two pounds. So I want to stick, stick to the light stuff. I have a Daiwa Saros 3000 class reel. This is one of the new bubble rods. They just came out with these this winter. This is the Tidal Select, uh, seven foot rod, fast action. Real nice rod. I'm impressed with it so far. It casts really well. Nice lightweight setup. Nice handle on it. Nice grip. And as far as our main line, I have, I believe this is 10 pound Power Pro braided line for the main line. We have a, about a three foot section of five pound test fluorocarbon. And when it comes to lures, anything shiny, flashy, 
Um, essentially anything you would use to catch trout is going to work. These fish are not all that fussy. Uh, marabou jigs can be good, hair jigs can be good, inline spinners. Just try mixing it up. Um, some days, you know, real cloudy today, it seems like chartreuse and the brighter colors seem to work better. But you never really know from one day to the next what's going to be the hot ticket. So if you're not getting bit, just switch it up. White perch can be a very prolific fish. One female can lay upwards of 50,000 eggs. Um, but it takes really certain conditions for them to have a good spawn. So you have good years and bad years. And we've been seeing a lot of smaller fish so far. Hopefully we can pull something somewhat sizable out of the mix. All right, we got a Bigfoot sighting, boys. Get ready to run. That thing gets any closer, we need to get out of here. It appears it's been watching me for a while. It, it, it seems to have learned how to fish. I think that's actually the fishing rod that was in the back of my truck. Oh, there we go. We're in a bit of a lull here. Things got real quiet. Changed over to a Thomas Boyant spoon. It's a little bit better. It's a decent white perch, still not huge, but definitely above the eight inch limit, nice and thick. Get a couple of nice little fillets off this guy. Get three fish now, I think we get enough for our lunch. Yeah, and these guys are actually closely related to the striped bass, they're in the same family. Um, they're found in both fresh and salt water but they particularly thrive in brackish water. We got really no other competition in here. All right, we're making some progress now. It is a better fish. That's more what we were looking for. Let's see these fish are definitely eating well in here. That's a real fat fish for its size. Real thick shoulders on them. Nice colors, beautiful fish. They don't like to over harvest out of this spot. It's a relatively small pond. All right, it's time for lunch. We had a fairly productive morning. Got some nice white perch here. Um, I've had these packed in ice for about an hour and a half now. I always like to ice down my fish for as long as I can. Makes them a lot easier to fillet. So that is going to be step one. They're firmed up nicely, nice and stiff, nice and cold. I like to angle the first cut back towards the head a little bit, get a little bit more meat off it. These guys aren't that big, so there's not going to be a whole lot of meat. Work down along the spine. This is a good little trick I do with most of the fish I fillet. Pretty much everything other than tuna or flounder is I start the, the cut on the first side and then I flip the fish over. And that's going to make it easier to get the second fillet off the fish when you have it with one fillet off and the head's kind of bumping it up. It can make it a little tough to get that second side off. And on a bigger fish, I would go through the rib cage. There's a little bit of meat down here. These are so small, it's really not going worth going after. 
I'd rather have a completely boneless fillet on them. Down to the rib cage, go around the rib cage. Like I said, we're gonna lose a little bit of meat on that fillet, but in the big scheme of things, it's not really gonna matter. One little fillet. Now, as we go back to do the second side, now the cut is already started. Around the rib cage. Save the rack for the garden. So I'm gonna angle back towards the tail and that's just gonna give me a little bit of a handle to start the skinning process. So as you can see, not a lot of meat there, but it is early March. Not a lot of options around for fresh fish. It's not big, but it's gonna taste good. All right, next step is to rinse them off. We're gonna have some scales. We got a little bit of slime on there. I like to get them nice and clean. Some people will tell you that you shouldn't use fresh water to rinse a filet. Um, ideally, I would use salt water, but it's just a real quick rinse. We're gonna cook in these fish right away. Fresh water is not gonna have any kind of effect on them. And I also like to get them nice and dry. Take some paper towels, get all that moisture off there. there you have one cute little filet. So you can see it's a real lean white meat on these, not a lot of dark meat. It has a similar texture to striper. It's a little bit firmer than like a sea bass or a cod. Very delicate flavor, slightly sweet. And obviously there's not a lot of meat on the fish, but we're talking about late March in New England. Don't have a lot of options. And when life gives you a little fish, make little sandwiches. That's what we're gonna do. So today for lunch, I'm gonna be whipping up a classic recipe. I'm gonna make a blackened white perch slider. This is a classic and really simple recipe that is accredited to Chef Paul Prudhomme. He was really one of the pioneers of Creole cooking. Um, he had a restaurant in New Orleans. Around 1980, he came out with a new dish that he called blackened redfish magic. And he obviously made it with redfish, which are red drum. Um, fairly firm fish similar to what we're working with here and the recipe became so popular that it actually crashed the redfish stocks they had to change all the regulations so many restaurants were making this that there was a big push commercially to basically what they did was overfish the redfish um, it was actually one of the first fish that they went to a slot limit with and they have rebounded since but when a recipe causes an entire stock of fish to collapse, that's a good testament that it's a good recipe. And I'm going to start by cutting these fillets in half. We're going to do one fillet per slider. One thing you don't want to do is use your good quality fillet knives to cut on a cutting board. That's probably the fastest way to dull them. So I'm going to use a chef knife. I'm just going to pop these guys in half. Six slider, I think that should be enough. Save those for dinner. Make some fish tacos out of them. Nice. Oh, look who's here. Cheech, just in time for a free lunch. That's, that's what I do. <laughs> Your timing is impeccable. Freeloader. <laughs> Looking forward to the body sliders. Yeah, we're gonna make some uh, blackened white perch sliders. And classic recipe, very simple to make. It's kind of a unique technique where there's some critical steps that really make it what it is. And the first of which is we're gonna need a good cast iron skillet and we wanna get this as hot as possible. So I'm gonna preheat this on medium heat and I'm gonna let that warm up for at least 10 minutes. Really the way to tell when your pan is ready is if, if you can hold on to the handle, it's not ready. You wanna get this thing piping hot Step two is we have some unsalted butter. 
We're going to melt that. We're going to turn on the right burner and just put that on a, a low heat. We don't want to brown it. You've got the, uh, the Chef Paul's Magic. Is that what we use for your blackening? It's classic. It's a classic, and I'm not usually big on pre-mixed spices. You could really make that yourself, mm -hmm. but just in order to save time. Yeah. You know, it's a blend of about seven or eight spices, paprika, there's some oregano in there, garlic powder, onion powder, a little bit of chili powder, um, but it's good stuff. It's been around for years. You can find this in most supermarkets. I have had problems lately finding it. If you can't find it, just go online. You can find copycat recipes to mix your own. We're just going to dust these with a little bit of salt. Do that on both sides. And this is kind of a key step. Because we're salting the fish first, that's going to draw some of the moisture out of it. We're going to let it sit for about 10 minutes in the fridge after we put it in the seasoning. And that's going to make your seasoning stick to it a lot better when it goes into the pan. And don't be shy with the seasoning. It's not necessarily spicy. There is a little bit of heat to it. So I'm gonna go with about a half a jar. And this is not part of the traditional recipe. Chef Paul Prudhomme did not include any flour. But I like to just mix a little bit in there and that's gonna give it a little bit of a crisp crust on it. Let's see, that's about it tablespoon or two of flour. Just gonna mix that together with a fork. All right, our butter is just barely melted. Still a little bit of solid butter in there. We don't necessarily want it to be super hot. And then what we do is we dip each piece of fish into the butter and then into the seasoning. And press it down in there, make sure it's well coated. And because we salted that fish, it's going to draw some of the moisture out of it, which is going to make the spices stick to it better when it's in the pan. All right, we get these little guys all buttered up and covered in spices. I'm going to pop them in the fridge now. And that's really going to help the spices adhere to the fish. And as you can see here, we're starting to see a little bit of smoke coming out of the pan. That means we're getting close. It handles hot, but it could be hotter. All right, King's Hawaiian slider rolls. These things are the best. They're fairly sweet, which I think goes really well with the, the spice of the fish. All right, we're gonna put about a quarter of a slice of American cheese. And anytime I make a fish sandwich, I always put the cheese in the bottom. And the only reason I do that is because that's how McDonald's does it with a filet of fish sandwich. It's a long-lived mystery. Nobody really knows why the cheese goes on the bottom, but I figured if they do it, I should too. And some people will tell you that cheese and fish shouldn't be put together. Uh, I think that's hogwash. There's nothing wrong with using some cheese with your fish. I'm gonna pop these guys in the oven. All right, we've been preheating our cast iron skillet for about 10 minutes now. I'm touch the handle. Ooh, that's hot. I can't grab that. That means our pan is ready. We have our chilled fillets, which is going to help keep them from overcooking. Oh, uh, critical next step. We want full throttle on the vent. If we're lucky, we might even get some flames here. And now another critical step. We are going to put a spoonful of melted unsalted butter 
on top of each one of these. Don't be shy with the butter. And these are all going to take about two minutes per side. And they're going to appear to be a little bit burnt, but that's actually what you're going for. That's what makes it blackened. And then I'm, these are pretty much cooked through at this point. I'm just going to go for about another minute on the second side. And then it'll be time to pig out. All right, time for service. So we're going to put the flat pieces down first. These are from the tail section of the filet. Top those off with the thicker shoulder portion. So there you have it, blackened white perch sliders, little fish, little sandwiches, time to pig out. That's good. I like the sweetness of that bread and the spiciness of the fish. Yeah. It's not super spicy, it's just really tastes the herbs. I've, I've never had, um white perch before and it reminds me a lot like winter flounder oddly enough similar it's fine it has that it has that like texture of it and um yeah that's really good yeah it's mild not fishy at all mm -hmm. but firmer than like a sea bass yeah almost like a winter flounder as far as the texture goes yeah good stuff yeah that's interesting that's awesome